Hey everyone, I just wanted to take a quick minute to let you know that we've launched our Patreon site and that you can now become a supporter of the show. The awards in there include artist features on our website and shout outs on the show, as well as open invitations to join fellow patrons in our roundtable discussion episodes. So if you think you might be interested, please take a look at the link in the description or just go to patreon.com slash at percussion. So slash A-T percussion. Okay, thanks for listening. Perfect. <laughs> we don't need to sing that. See that I'm drinking absolute. You know, <laughs> the corporate yeah. sponsorships on this. Until they sponsor us, we're not going to give them any free advertising. Damn it! That's cool that it just comes in a to-go mug now because people they just know like you're going to just get in the car with your absolute vodka. And Casey, Casey, no joke. Here in Louisiana, one of the big things is drive up daiquiri places. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and wait for it. Here's the craziest part. So we were thinking, we we're like, wait, how is that possible with like open container laws and stuff like that? Right. You can pull up order your daiquiri and they will give it to you and what they'll do is they'll pop the straw in and that but they'll they'll pull the all of the paper off except the very top so as long as that top part of paper stays on covering the top it is technically not considered an open container so you can still oh open it God. take a sip and put it back right to- totally but <laughs> yeah, that's right. like that's how they get yeah. through it and i was just uh, like like what where am i living right now it's like <laughs> You know, next thing we'll have like a bad president or something. That's crazy. <laughs> it's gonna get 2020, so- man. I mean, could be anything at this point. <laughs> well, whoop de doo de doo. It's that percussion podcast. I'm Casey Cangelosi. This is episode 244. And we're recording on July 26th. And we're releasing on August 20th. So, hey there, everybody. With me, as usual, we've got Carly Vina. Hey. Yeah, it's going to be a sound effect episode. We've got, we've got Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. I'll take <laughs> And we've also got Ksenia the Hurricane Komjanovich. Oh, where is it? There it is. I knew it. Damn it. I knew it. <laughs> there wasn't much thought put into this. Ksenia, is the hurricane okay? How's it going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's over. We're past the, like, no power. You know, your uh, sensor is freaking out because of the humidity and keeping you awake and all the water getting into the apartment phase. So it's all good now. I did a hurricane once. It was no power for a long time in Houston. It was called Hurricane Ike. It was okay. It was okay? Yeah. Yeah. It just took a long time. It's scary. No, this was just uncomfortable. Very lucky here. Just uncomfortable. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Also, Brian, the Wizard of Nas, is here. Hi, Brian. Hello, everyone. I don't get a sound. I don't get a sound effect. That's okay. No, I got one. I got one. I got one. Perfect. I don't trust, I don't trust any of the other ones. I would go with the ones I, I rehearsed. <laughs> yeah. Brian, I just want to say that I came up with the Wizard of Nas, and you didn't react to it at all. <laughs> I mean, I think my little, my like, my little league team in like fifth grade was called like it's that's an old one for me. So I'm sorry. It's not that it's I was ignoring you. I just, I, I just, it washes over me now. I don't even hear it anymore. I'm sorry. They called, they called me Casey Can of Baloney. Nice. <laughs> that's pretty nice. funny. Yeah. No, it's not bad. I look back on that. I go like, that's pretty clever for kids. <laughs> and it's also Italian. So true. Very good point. Pretty thought out. Yeah, I don't think they do that. Well, hey, real quick before we introduce Hal on uh, what did I say? We released on August twentieth. Um, news for today: Voyager space probe launched with the golden record on it. We've talked about this before. Certainly, I think we've talked about it at length before. But this is the day it happened. Let's see. It happened in nineteen seventy-seven. And I know we've talked about uh, just you know, what this is and a lot of music that's on there. But one quote that I thought was really, really fun. One of the pieces of music that's on there is, oh, I lost it already. Oh, time to edit. Let's see here. There we go. Carl Sagan. 
<laughs> yeah. So yeah, if anything gets real weird, how he will edit these. So, like this is not going to be in the show. Right? Oh yeah. yeah <laughs> oh, it will. Be, yeah, it you will. might not even be the guest, Hal. It, <laughs> yeah, right. It's going to end up being my dad or something. <laughs> So, but anyway, re- regarding uh, the inclusion of some of the, the music, so supposedly the inclusion of Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good was controversial in that some claiming that including rock music was adolescent, to which Carl Sagan, the very famous Carl Sagan scientist, author, and um, yeah, um, public speaker for science and a voice of science said that, uh, well, there are a lot of ad- adolescents on this planet. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, Brian, if you had to put one additional piece of music on the Space Probe record to represent humanity, what would you have included? Oh, I mean, probably something by Pantera. <laughs> Cowboys from Hell? Cowboys from Hell, probably, or maybe maybe This Love. Uh-huh, you know, uh-huh, uh-huh. Like yeah, actually, yeah, what's, what's the, he- I don't know what the heaviest thing on there is. I've got the list right here. Oh, Magic Flute. Actually, the heaviest, <laughs> the heaviest thing is probably Bright of Spring. Yes, yes, I would agree. Carl Sagan actually wanted to include Brian Nosny's Purdy's Maze, but it wasn't <laughs> yet. <laughs> this was too adolescent. But uh, no, I just I want to add that was infantile. That's not even adolescent. That's infantile. <laughs> he did to draw the line somewhere. One one other quick little fact about and I could go on about the Golden Record. I, I love the story of it so much. But the whole Chuck Berry thing. There was actually a Saturday Night Live sketch. Uh, that referenced it. They had this, it was basically a news program with psychics telling the news from tomorrow. And in one of the news clips, one of the psychics said that the aliens had received the golden record and they sent back a message saying, send more Chuck Berry, which I think. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really that's cool. Awesome. Well, great. So you all are educated on what happened today. And Brian, who who's with us? Tell us about Hal. And Hal, well, by the way, like were those sound effects impressive? Do you think you can get me a job in the in the industry? Was that yeah? I mean, uh, I mean, your your creativity was was really uh, bar none. Uh, I, I think I think okay. really, um, yeah. Oh, I I can get you a job tomorrow if you want. <laughs> there we go. Cleaning. Well, great. I knew that was I knew that was worth someone's time. Well, Brian, tell us tell us about Hal a little bit. Well, we're really excited to have Hal Rosenfeld here. Uh, I've known him for a number of years. He's a percussionist, composer, arranger, and orchestrator. Uh, he can be heard on over a hundred uh, bits of media from film, television, video games. Uh, recent work of his includes uh, the Emmy uh, being a music producer on the Emmy award-winning music team for FX's Fosse Verdon. Uh, he's played on the Grammy awarding, award-winning soundtrack for The Greatest Showman movie. Uh, other projects that he's played on include HBO's new Perry Mason series, which I'm dying to see. Uh, the video the, the video game that is Fortnite, that is a huge thing, obviously, right now. Uh, Netflix is a series of unfortunate events. And uh, Zombieland Double Tap, which I would argue is just as good as the original, but that's just me. He's also the house drummer for the Daytime Emmys. He kind of wears all sorts of hats. As a composer, arranger, and orchestrator, he's contributed to Disney's new Mulan movie, uh, the new Penny Dreadful series, uh, City of Angels, uh, In the Heights, Dollface, Quantico, Need for Speed Payback, and many others. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's done just uh, all sorts of stuff with all sorts of people, but probably the best bio line I've ever seen <laughs> in my life is that Hal currently lives in Los Angeles, where he once made prolonged eye contact with Emma Watson at a party. So... Please thank you, Hal Rosenfeld, for joining us today. Thank you. Brian, you get an award for, that was quite a mouthful. <laughs> but great to be here, everyone. Um, I, I've actually been a, been a big admirer of both Casey and Brian's work for ever. I've played pieces by both of you. Um, so oh, wow, pretty thanks. Exciting. It, was that my piece that you played in that really famous movie? And <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, it was, right? right? Yeah. And where are his royalty checks? <laughs> well, you uh, live in a house uh, in Virginia remote, so I'm sure you're getting the royalty checks. <laughs> hey, hey, how I heard of a friend of mine, a colleague, John Peterson. He uh, was like his yeah. one of the teachers. That's I awesome. Thought, yeah. John John taught um I took music theory from him. Yeah, it must have been freshman year at Florida State University. I I, I did my first year of college at FSU uh, with Dr. Parks and the whole the whole A team over there. And yeah, and uh John Peterson was my music theory, I think music theory or ear training. Uh, I don't remember which, but no, he was he was great. He was um, yeah. he was definitely he was he was he was great. He was super nice, super helpful. Th- there were some other 
teachers uh, there who were grad students who maybe not as much. So I, I definitely uh, I like him a lot. That's awesome. Yeah, we love we like we yeah, we love John Peterson to death. He's just excellent, excellent theory teacher, and yeah, oh, really really good colleague. Uh, but what uh, you know, just while we're talking about that, what did what did like how how much of your like traditional theory style training goes into what you do? Um, that's a good question because I think it really depends. Um, you know, I like really, and what I mean by that is, you know, one day, you know, I could be writing like a symphony of of some sort for whatever you know whether that actually fits into a project or. You know, oftentimes, like in said movie or TV show, our two main characters are going to the opera house to see, you know, to see, you know, insert opera or something here. And the production either can't pay for whatever it is they actually are actually seeing or whatever. So they say, oh, composer, um, and on top of the score, can you also write, you know, a few minutes of opera music that will serve as like incidental music or something like that to make it look like they're actually seeing an opera? Um but, you know, I'd say because I wear different hats, you know, half half my world is as, is as a percussionist and drummer, you know, and then the other half is as a composer and orchestrator and a couple different things under that realm. I'd say most of my, like, proper training goes with um, my job as an orchestrator, which, which, would, which can mean a couple different things. Um, in the classical sense, you think like, okay, here's a piano sketch. And now make a full orchestration of that for full ensemble, whatever it is, which is which is a um, which is a definition of the word orchestration. Um, I do some of that, but in the film music sense, a lot of what orchestration means is uh, like a composer, um, whoever it be, writes the music using uh, sampler instruments and you know MIDI and all that stuff. And you know, for those who don't know, MIDI is like in Garage Band or logic or whatever when you hit the little little middle c and it makes a saxophone sound you see that little dot come up in the thing that that dot is a piece of computer data that if it's going to be played by real musicians then has to be put on to paper so you're talking but, like but it's but sorry it's only it's only midi if the saxophone sounds like a like an accordion right yeah, like I it's, sound. <laughs> and like it's, only, it's only midi if the marimba sounds like a, a piano xylophone hybrid right I, I yeah I I'd love to say yes but man you'd be surprised at at how good things sound and you know and the 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 biggest deal about orchestration is you know when something gets to you as an orchestrator from the composer um it you have to think it's already been approved it's been given the the blue check mark by directors producers you know head of music at Disney or something and they want to hear what it's going to sound like after it's done, but before it's done. And so your job as an orchestrator is to make sure it's going to sound, um, you know, as good, if not just have that, you know, tinge of human performance to it, than the mock-up or the demo. Um, you know, your job is not to look at the MIDI and say, oh, you know, that bass line clashes with the with the French horns, I'm just going to change it and, and like fix it, um, you know, as you know, you can red flag it, but um, you know, your job is to say, oh, that violin line is out of range or that, that, that um, those woodwind lines are unplayable because you have them sustaining whole notes for 74 bars. Um, that's your job is to make it work. You know? Or like there's way too many notes in this <laughs> bass guitar line, better give it to the timpanist. <laughs> yeah, right. I've heard, yeah. about, heard about that one a lot. Yeah, I mean, in it, the biggest eye-opener for me when I first came to L.A. And, and actually seeing a real like scoring session happen was it's very uncommon for timpanists to have only four drums. Um, I mean, you'll yeah. go to a session and a timpanist will have nine or ten drums. Uh, if not more, maybe a hair less, like, um, you know, t percussionists in town own 20 drums to have like a backup set, you know, t because, because you'll get these parts that are just obviously not written by a percussionist or, and orchestrators aren't usually percussionists and they'll, you'll get these w chromatic lines and, you know, runs or something that, you know, there's just, because as the player, your job is to sight read the first or second take and it's done. You know, you have to be prepared to be able to uh, to play whatever's given to you. And there's a really great video that composer Michael Giacchino posted of the legendary percussionist Don Williams, who, yes, is the brother of John Williams. Um, he, he He's like kind of the first call timpanist. And he it was, I believe it was Incredibles 2 or the, whatever the last Incredibles that came out of him reading the end credits. And it was just like he's just doing all of this. And it's like just it's, it's gnarly. Yeah. 
gnarly tippity stuff. Quick good all talk yeah. to us. The Ted Cats percussion seminar, he showed us some pictures and oh, yeah. Yeah, holy cow! Just like, oh yeah, that's that's a lot of timpani. That's uh, you're basically yeah. just playing a bass line. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really intimidating. Um, yeah, I I I try to steer a little bit away from timpani because that that's a thing where like if you need to be doing it constantly, like you know, already four drums and tuning stuff is enough. But like when you, you know, you got to be worrying about pitch and it's just um, you know, it's it's a bit much. Um, but the, the the one the one experience I had with something similar as I played on a music video for something Mulan oriented and the bass and the timpani part was a bit wonky, but because it was a music video shoot, they said, okay, here are the drums you have. And they only gave me three drums and had all these different pedal changes. And it was wild. And I'd marked up the part and then, um, and then Don Williams played it on the date and, and we were having to do it in chunks because even he with 10 timpani was just wild. But had I not had the you know, hour breakfast break that I took to not eat and figure out this, wild timpani part <laughs> it's not even that bad it's just chromatic and it's it's like not a lot of time and but yeah that's cool ben i think you had something yeah well yeah. first of all i was gonna say i I've, I've seen those pictures of like yeah i, I think the, i think the one i saw it's like six or seven timpani not not like 10 but yeah. i can i can imagine having sight read gigs with bad orchestrators um not saying that, that that's the case with you <laughs> no, it's well but, and and that's the thing is that orchestrators your job is to not leave anyone out to dry and yeah. you know sometimes it happens you know and it, it is what it is but yeah sorry go on I mean, but you know i was gonna i was gonna ask uh, maybe about five to ten episodes ago we had uh michael amatina on and and he talked about he has relatives that work in the hollywood film industry and he talked about how much that the film industry had influenced him as a musician and one of the films he cited was Stanley Kubrick's *The Shining*, which I actually watched in preparation for that episode. And I didn't know this till I was reading about it, but *The Shining* is known for its just incredible music direction, both the original score by Wendy Carlos, and then these fantastic uh, arrangements of uh, *Symphony Fantastique* and excerpts of um, *Penderecki* and all that crazy, crazy stuff. Um, so that's obviously like a, a monument in the film scoring handbook. But I was wondering, what are some of the other great films that, that you've taken inspiration from? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, there is a percussionist, um, you know, who actually recently passed away. His name's Emil Richards. For those of you who may know about him, he was really, uh, I believe he, he was known at one point to have the largest collection of percussion instruments in the world. Um, and, you know, his percussion collection was really pretty out, consisted of a lot of pretty out there stuff um, that has because he was the only one who owned them, whether he made them himself or he 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 would travel all over the world and find these you know some pretty wild stuff. And but that be, a lot of those things became trademarks of certain movies like um, Planet of the Apes, the original Planet of the Apes um, has some, I forgot which, that might be the score of his with the boobams, I don't know if you know, guys know what boobams are, they're like these small, yeah, they're kind of like these small, like, pitched drums that kind of look like oct octobons, I guess, um, but they come in, like, a set of, like, an octave or two octaves or whatever, um, and, uh, in fact, players here really hate if they see you playing on them with sticks, because the heads are, you cannot find a heads anywhere, and so if someone sees you with sticks, they'll, like, grill you, because <laughs> you're, you're gonna be the person to break these, and everyone's gonna be angry at you um um you know he, he had st all, stuff that just you know um all sorts of weird om glock in and and like basically things that maybe you'd see in textbooks but he had more of them and they were just way out there in fact um i, I actually did get to attend his his um funeral ceremony and his wife said that the the um the limit for her you know because they travel all over the world just just to get stuff and the limit for her was forgot where they were but he was offered a, a, some some instrument made out of a human skull and she said that's where i draw the line i'm not going back through customs <laughs> holding a human skull <laughs> in our back <laughs> what he had a human skull he almost did i guess he they, i forgot where she said they had gone but the line for her was when he wanted to bring back this like human skull that was uh that that was that had been some sort of instrument or maybe just to have and uh but yeah so he had everything and so I mean, he's really kind of set a trademark on certain sounds of Hollywood. Um, so pretty much, you know, he's got all sorts of weird pots and pans and, um, 
you know, I, I'm just kind of blanking on, you know. Yeah, right. Oh, stuff, yeah, but... so much. And, and we've talked about him before, and we've talked about that World of Percussion book. And we actually had him yeah. on the show I, I, quite a while ago. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, but he, he didn't tell us about the, uh, the skull. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sweetest guy. I I I'd encountered him yeah because my mentor moving out here was a guy named uh, is a guy named uh, Bernie Dressel, who you know most well known for like dr- playing drums in the Brian Setzer Orchestra for a long time, but also he's just like played drums on every movie you know everywhere. But he he played drums in um, Amol's big band um, that would play at this uh, Thai restaurant in Santa Monica like once or twice a month. Um, and for the first uh, few years that I lived out here, I was Bernie's like drum tech. I'd show up to all of his gigs and set up his drums and then you know, watch and learn and then tear him down. And so I, I'd be, I got to go to a ton of Amal gigs and Amal was just, just a, a, a sweetheart, really, really wicked sense of humor. Um, so, um, never got to play in a section with him, but, um, but he really, he's, you know, left a really crazy mark on, on our world, but. I draw inspiration from a lot of places, really a lot of non-film music stuff, like chamber music, um, you know, orchestral music, rock music. Um, so that's yeah, that's awesome. I was actually you, I was going to ask about Emil and you sort of already you already covered most of it. Uh, and I was going to ask, uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to say that in addition to all the wonderful musical things and the amazing instrument collection, I think you would agree that all L.A. musicians owe a debt to Emil for his work with uh with unions and fair pay and i mean oh, he yeah. was really really instrumental in the the sort of contract business legal side of things that's just a, a very well-known fact um but then yeah. also yeah i was gonna ask it sounds like probably no but did you ever actually work with emil in a session uh never in a session i i, I would just really see him kind of at his big band gigs and you know he'd always always say hello to me um you know it was just always just you know it wasn't a thing where you know i was super young and the, like the drum tech where a lot of people just write off the help but he was just really he was just really i always really great encounters with him i mean it was really touching and inspiring being at his memorial service because pretty much everyone had stories kind of like what you just said ben where you know, he was a section leader that he wanted to make sure the section was just always there and ready to go. He was never competing. You know, you know, some people use uh, the section leader position as like their time to get the best parts or like it, he was always just a very warm guy and with a wicked sense of humor. Um, so, yeah, I, I, the whole music world is really indebted to to um, to, to Emil for for sure. My favorite thing about having him on our episode was when he got pretty fiery over just kind of the state of how the film industry has changed and how yeah. like, oh, the, the, there's so many producers and directors and there's so many people influencing the composers. And he, he was, it was great. He went on this, I thought, wonderful rant about how, you know, back in, uh, you know, just probably just the 90s, they, they would have said, hey, get out of here. You're not the composer. What are you doing? We don't care how, you know, I've been hired as the composer. I'm write this music. You, I don't care what the producer says about this line or this or that. I mean, go back and listen to it. It was it was really, really great. And, I, and I, obviously Hal is much, much younger than Hamill Richards. But do you have any thoughts about that? Like, you know, obviously, you must know the history of this probably, probably quite a lot. And do you, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, no, I mean that, that that is a really good a really good point to bring up because that is you know I feel like I get to see it in a little bit of a different light, be only because I'm often on in the booth with the composer or as the composer, but also as much as I'm also on the other side as a player, um, and it's you know it's it's really tough because um, you know, it didn't used to be like that where you know, com- you know, a producers, directors, studio executives all want to hear what it's going to sound like, you know, after it's done, before it's done. And so when everyone is at the session, you often, you know, you can get, you know, stuck to work with people who are just genuinely like, let you do your own thing. Um, or you are with people who, who say, oh, what's that instrument? I, I-, I didn't approve of that instrument. Or like, you know, you, you hear these stories of, you know, of like a director, I've heard the story a few, a few times saying like, um, oh yeah, that, that, that melody sounds nice, but can we try that in the treble clef? Like, you know, stuff like that, or like, um, there's another one I was told of, I don't, I don't remember what, I mean, you know, th- there are, you know, like there's a story about John Williams, um, you know, someone was saying, oh, this isn't, th- th- this isn't great, like I don't, I don't like this for whatever reason, um, and, you know, the next day, 
the possession. John Williams said, I, I fixed it. I, I kind of did something. And he did nothing different. He just con- conducted the same piece over again. And, oh, this that was perfect, perfect. Um, you know, it's just like a, a lot of times it's like a power assertion. Um, and half of our jobs as composers are psychologists. Um, you know, maybe 30% of your time is actually spent writing music. You know, you're, a lot of your time is spent as like a financial advisor because you're sometimes you are the person in charge of all of the money for the, you know, for the project. Other times you are the, the psychologist. You've got a director who says they want one thing. You've got a producer who says they want an entirely opposite thing, but the producer is paying your, you know, paying your fee. And the director is the person who's going to recommend you again. You know, it's, it, it's, it's tough. Um, it's tough, but it's something that I think is really important that we, we as artists learn no matter what you're doing, because, at the end of the day, we're in the service industry just as much as someone who works at McDonald's or something. You know, if a customer says, my food's cold and in a really nasty tone, you're not going to sn- you know, snip back at them and say, well, you're the one who ordered it or you're, you were outside smoking a cigarette the whole time. Uh, you know, you got to unfortunately like say, OK, well, let's do what we can to fix it. And whether you go in the back and talk shit and give them the same food, just heat it up. That's, you know, you, you, that's one solution, um, you know, so. It is a thing that you have to deal with and that is very prevalent. Um, you know, it's it's something that I think a lot of people just need to kind of let go of because it's just, you know, that's, that's our job um, is writing music, putting our heart and soul into it, and the next day it get completely turned down and you got to go back and do something from scratch all over again. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, trying to think. How, how maybe you could go into this a little bit because when, you, you know, when we watch a movie and we're seeing all the credits at the end, there's so many different roles that are going on obviously they're like we get what the composer is ideally we get what the orchestrator is now but like what and probably a music supervisor is the person that's just in charge of the whole thing is is monitoring everything but what does because i know that you just served as a music producer what is the role of a music producer in the soundtrack type of setting um you know I, that's one of those things that kind of depends on by, by project sometimes credits are given to people as like consolation prizes Sometimes they're given to people as like, you did way more than you were asked to do, but we don't want to give you the credit that you actually deserve. So here's a credit that sounds like you did something. Um, uh, you know, but like usually as it goes, um, a music supervisor is um, really in charge of um, like rights and clearances. Like, you know, they're, they want to play Chuck Berry in the, you know, in space. So the music supervisor is going to be the one to reach out to chuck berry's label and make sure you know and how much are they going to charge for this and so they're really handling the money side the business paperwork side with record labels and stuff um and artists and oftentimes they're kind of checking in with the composers and the score side of things uh, but then you have the music editor who's you know usually the next person kind of underneath who mainly deal they're kind of the go-betweens between like the production and the music team um whether it be a number of things like, you know, whether it be correction notes, like, like revision notes, or a lot of times in TV especially, um, where there's just so much music and such a little amount of time to do it. Because um, like TV, you know, you, you're doing an episode more or less in real time. you got a week or two to do it and could be 30 or 40 minutes of music, you know, at most, if not more or less. Um, so oftentimes a music editor will be able to kind of help edit the music. Like, okay... This was working from two episodes ago. This works really well in this scene. So the music editor will, you know, edit the music and, you know, take it take it off the composer's plate if they have bigger things to worry about. Um, then below that, then, you, you know, you have the composer who is composing the music um, or at least a team leader. You know, so, so you, some circumstances they might not be the one writing all the music, but they're certainly the team leader. Um, and then below that, you could have someone as a music producer Um you know, who is either calling shots and saying, oh, yeah, you know, you know, it'd be really good here if we had a section that did something like this, like, you know, or or a music producer could also mean they're actually producing the music. Like in, a, in the pop music world, you see like this Carly Rae Jepsen track was produced by so and so. They were the one who actually like, you know, produced the, the, the track and like all those cool rising noises and like those weird vocal effects that was like the producer you know um so music producer can mean either they're actually producing music or they're like you know calling the shots like quincy jones like in the recording session being like ah i like vocal take number 94 better than vocal tech 95 you know um you know 
in a sense, you know, I, I can get into more like of what my credits mean because the, really there's a story be, be behind each project. But then you have assistants who can be doing anything from getting coffee to actually writing the music to to you know um, doing more arranging stuff. Like if a you know composer has written a bunch of music and say, okay, hey, can you arrange my theme under this scene? That's you know a music arranger, an assistant, or you know, and then. Um, yeah, then you have various, sometimes you see like a music coordinator, which is like someone who often takes care of like the travel. Let's say like the, the music is recorded in London, like the score coordinator, score production coordinator, something like that will take care of handling, you know, airplanes and hotels for the whole team. And, you know, they, you know, there's, so I know it's, it's, it's weird. Um, so there's a lot of things going on <laughs> is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are, yeah, there's a lot of things going on for sure. It's, Gotcha. It's weird because um, it's like in the classical world, like Casey, like you get commissioned to write a piece of music. You're coming up with the idea. You're writing the music. We think. Uh, <laughs> I think it's. I think it's your child, maybe. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> writing the music, and then you not not only are you doing that, but you're also making sure it's playable or quasi playable for a player. And then you're you're also engraving the parts. Um, you know, you're, which that's a whole nother job, a copyist, uh, you know, or music preparation you'll see in credits, which is someone who takes the scores and makes them legible and actually extracts the parts for the orchestra. Cause sometimes those turnarounds are within hours, you know, like we're actually working on the music the night before the session, you know, um, like I, I remember on Mulan, I was in the back room at Sony scoring stage, orchestrating the cue for after the lunch break. And then someone's got to actually pull out all extract all those parts for that whole orchestra and print them and tape them and you know so and that's um i saw one of your jobs as copyist yeah yeah I, yeah so so you're at finale you're at sibelius you're yeah. cranking stuff out quick right yeah. is that what that yeah. means yeah 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 exactly cranking stuff out quick and make because um making sure it's going to look right for the player i think i've always had a knack for like how things look on the page because i think all of us have just seen parts that just you know we know what we want to see you know and and so i i think that's that's been a way especially in my earlier years here of being able to really kind of dissect you know the, like 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 the a-list stuff like be able to really you know dive into orchestrations and like see what people are doing just because i get to handle the files you know and um yeah it's a definitely co copyist is a tough one because you're the last person on a totem pole you're the person who's going to get the the you know the the brunt if there's a wrong accidental or yeah, it's a tough position to be in. <laughs> well, but I, I, I had a question based on something you said. Uh, I teach a music appreciation class. And one of the things we talk about is uh, what I call musical copycats, which can end in lawsuits. Uh, <laughs> a great example is like the, the Robin Thicke blurred lines. Marvin Gaye got to give it up. And you talked about, you know, OK, we're going to get the you know, we have to get the rights for this Chuck Berry song for this scene, things like that. There was actually a Chuck Berry lawsuit like that with the Beatles. I won't go into. Uh, yeah. But have is there I, like so to be clear, legally, you cannot copyright like the feel of a song or the beat of a song. It's too generic uh, or even the chord progression. So there's obviously quite a bit of legal wiggle room. But is there ever a concern with, you know, oh, we can't get the rights to that, you know, song by the Beatles, let's just make another song that sounds like it. Is there ever any like icky copyright stuff that comes along with that? Oh, all the time. I mean, that's like more than more than our job sometimes is, um, you know, the director really loves. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a hot take here. Director really loves this one cue from The Dark Knight. Like this is this is they are obsessed with that, you know, that this cue. And, you know, just without saying it, they'll say, you know, do that without getting us sued, you know, where, you know, that, that, that is a lot of times because when, when you're working on a project, 90% of the time you'll, from, from the production or the editors or whoever, you'll, you'll get the movie or TV show or whatever with, what we call temp music in it, which is the, the, which is the production's way of communicating to us. We really like this vibe for this scene. We really like, um, you know, how this see, how this music makes us feel. So do something like this. And, you know, oftentimes you do have more freedom and other times you are kind of just tied to the temp, you know? Um, and so th th there often is that we really, um, you know, or we couldn't license this Beastie Boys song. So, but we really, really want sabotage, like really want sabotage. And you go, okay, well, 
I now, you know, now I gotta, you know, there's nothing, you know, because what is Sabotage known for? That, 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 the synth and the scratching sound, and you're just like, well, <laughs> um, so yes, that, that, that is fairly often because, um, you know, budgets are often really f fairly small. And so the, 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 it, a lot of what we do is a game of putting our mark on something, our creative mark on something, but also, um, you know, serving what the people actually want, which could be someone else's music. Yeah. So moving in a different direction, Hal, I wanted to ask, it's, it's happened to me a couple of times recently in South Florida, at least, that I've had high school students say, I really want to play in movie soundtracks. And it surprises me because I think like that wasn't really on my radar when I was that age, you know, in high school. Um, and I, I have a feeling it might be on some guidance counselor list of like possible <laughs> possible careers within the field of music um, or that, you know, the, the music is cool. Kids love movies, you know. But I'm wondering, what advice do you have for students that at that level know, like, I want to be basically in the in the world that you're living in and moving in and playing in? How can they get from where they are, you know, either as high school students or college students into their recording business? Yeah, that's a um, really great question, because I think uh, I think like two big points are coming to, to mind. First one is um, not only listening to all styles of music, but being able to play all styles of music and especially as percussionists. We we have such a vast world of stuff. I mean, stuff that isn't just like oh you buy it and you can hit it and it sounds good. Like stuff that takes like years of learning, you know, or you know, as like Latin percussion or Indian percussion or like any sort of ethnic percussion. Um, I think having a, at least a clue as to what that stuff sounds like is really important because the more styles of music you know how to play. Um, you know, the, the more marketable you are. I mean, it's, it's, it's surprisingly, at least to me, surprisingly less common for drum set players to also be able to take out four mallets and be able to read on marimba or vibes or something like that. Uh, you know, it's usually drum set players or drum set players and, you know, mallet percussionists or mallet percussionists. Um, and I think that's, that's something that, especially at the high school level, that was just kind of, I would say accidentally, but I wasn't aware I was being pushed as hard as I was. Um, you know, that I kind of came out of high school already be able to like groove on a tumbao and like a pattern or you know, congas or something and like knowing the proper technique and like slaps and knowing at least what tabla are like, you know, I would never, the one thing I say I can't do is tabla, but, uh, yeah, I think it's important to have that vast, um, you know, knowledge of just different things because it comes up. It, it really does. And, you know, sorry, Casey, you look like you have, uh, you want to chime in. Oh, just related to this, you know, if you had to advise one of these kiddos that Carly's talking about, is uh, you know, you have all this tech behind you. I see, I see gear, I see, I see tech stuff, and I know there's so much tech out there right now, and yeah. I think that can be really, really overwhelming for students, and maybe they want to compose and like. Right. So, what do you think, like traditional music major track or music industry track? I know that I know oh. that's really broad and like way too vague a question. So, yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, all good. I mean, I, I you know, that, that that's a good segue because my second point to Carly was to at least start getting yourself familiar as a high school student with a software. It could be as low as Garage. I mean, GarageBand is more complex than, than I realized. I recently, a couple of days ago, watched like a, like, uh, how to make this Katy Perry song all in GarageBand. And like, the dude was like, was nailing it. I was like, wow, so you can't actually use GarageBand for more than just that, that saxophone sound that sounds like the trumpet sound. Um, but, um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I think just familiarizing yourself with how to do that because we are in a world of self-recording, and you you not only have to be a performer, which takes years and hours and hours and hours of practice, but you also have to be an IT person. Like, why is it? Why is there no sound happening here? And I'm on the clock. And also, you know, um, how to properly, you know, okay, I, now I have to comp my drums and edit them and properly name my files correctly. And like, you know, there, you have to wear all these hats, and it's. It's, it's, it's quite frustrating, but I think now that high school students especially are really aware of the technology, I think um, just screwing around is like the best thing you can do. Um, yeah. Yes, thank you. I say that all the time. Thank you. <laughs> so it's nice okay. to say that. The, the, the financial bar of entry for this, I mean, it's so, so low now. I mean, obviously, you're not going to get Hollywood studio sort of sounds, but I mean, just to mess around in Logic, I mean, I, Logic, I think, without an educational discount is, I think, 200 bucks. 
Um, and I know, like, not that this is musically related, but like in animation, RenderMan, which is what Pixar uses, uh, you can actually download it for free for educational wow. use and just like mess around with it. So yeah, any any of this music technology stuff, I mean, to get a cheap little mixer and record your buddies playing saxophone and trombone and mess around yeah. with it, it's, it's totally cheap. And it, we, we were talking about it in our little chat here, but uh, you mentioned GarageBand and actually you can export GarageBand projects to Logic. Oh, so, amazing. Yeah, so like if you're a 16 year old kid, you mess around with GarageBand a bunch, then you go to school and you're 18 and you want to actually start, you know, going in more depth in Logic, you can take your GarageBand projects to Logic just like that. I right. you said your little buddy's saxophone and trombone. <laughs> I, 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 I imagine little stuffed animals playing. I mean, yeah, like it's pretty <laughs> cool to know that all saxophonists and trombonists are like small people. <laughs> I, just, I, I, imagine, I imagine Robin's uh, stuffed animals like playing. Yeah, trombone. Robin's all the size of an average trombone player. <laughs> I think Randy Newman wrote a song about this called Short People. Am I correct on that? <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably. Um, I wanted to ask a, a follow-up to that, which is I, I had the chance to study a little bit on the side during my doctoral studies to study film scoring and, you know, do MIDI mockups and so on. And I thought it was spectacularly interesting, but I was just wondering, what is your experience? And do you think that this is something that could be teachable at universities um, to a level that makes people very prepared when they enter the industry? Do you think that the industry, Hollywood, would like to receive recommendations from university professors like, hey, take this kid, they're really good. Is this even teachable at a university? Because obviously you're doing so much stuff that can only happen when there's a movie production going, right? Yeah, no, I, I do think a lot of this is teachable at the university level, 100%. Um, I think it's tough because, um, from you know, from what I from just from my peripheral vision, um, I'm probably the last person to advocate on any sort of educational, and I'm, I probably shouldn't even be in a room with you all and talking about what you what you all have studied. But um, but I think it is teachable because especially when it comes to mockups, it's all really technique. Um, it, it's all just knowing how to blend sounds together, um, which which I think really was kind of I felt a big strong skill coming from the percussion world and like just playing in percussion ensembles because. All, I mean, that's all all about color and I, I you know, different mallets. I mean, like you know, with with like a saxophone, you got like a cracked reed or a or a not cracked reed, and like you know, you can't really like you know wear different gloves to hit the keys or something. You know, we we it's so so a, a lot of those tricks that to make you know to take like free sounds and make them sound like a million bucks are really it's just like. Um, like mixing tips and really just kind of things that you kind of learn along the way. I think it's a hundred percent teachable. Um, I think obviously what's not teachable is like the drive and want to do it. Cause that stuff can be really time consuming and really frustrating. Um, you know, and I, I do think it's, you know, it's the, the price point is something that I think needs to be like addressed like vastly. I mean, I mean, I'm lucky to be able to afford the tools I need, but I think it's like really tough because a lot of these, just to be able to start entry level, you have you, know, you can't even buy a full orchestra as a full orchestra. You have to buy three different pieces to make a full orchestra, which could easily run a thousand dollars. And that's just one, you know, one piece of sampling software. Right. Um, you know, but I, I I do think this this stuff can for sure be teach can sure teach. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. <laughs> can for sure be taught. <laughs> you speak Serbian now. It's fine. I totally understand. <laughs> Well, I think, um, yeah, thanks so much for that. How I think we just covered uh, Milo Berger's Facebook question. So thanks, Milo. You were asking about how, how school it was involved in this. And I, I guess I kind of opened with how school was involved with this, too. So, yeah, thanks for the question on Facebook, Milo. Uh, ben, what are you thinking today? Oh, well, yeah, I had, I had one more question, Hal. Uh, and that is, uh, before we get into my little topic we can do today, but... Um, I was wondering, there's like this kind of this this joke that people say of like, oh, we'll fix it in post. Um, but having having done both audio and video recording myself, I'm amazed at how much stuff you can fix in post. Uh, I mean, you could it's like just un, unreal. I was wondering, do you have like a favorite story of something maybe that even came up after you recorded that you didn't notice that was like a we'll fix it in post moment? Oh, man, I feel like. <laughs> Like every project has like sure there's many. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess this. I'll think of a funny one in a second, but 
but working on um, a series called Fosse Verdon um, was really, um, that was kind of my first foray being really hands-on in a musical um, project. You know, um, I, 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 was rec- I was recommended for Fosse Verdon because I had met um, a guy by the name of Alex Lockamore, um, who's like, you know, the guy who arranged and wrote the Hamilton music with Lynn and, you know, Dervin Hansen in the Heights. He's like the Broadway guy. Um, and, you know, and so him and I did Fosse Verdon together as a team. And um, the thing that I was most, most kind of, that's stunned, but a lot of those numbers in the, in the show were actually shot to like piano demos, um, you know, that you're hearing this massive, you know, ensemble that we literally put in and post, um, you know, um, and the, it's, it's not shot through a loudspeaker, so you're not hearing the piano demos on set. You know, actors have called earwigs, like earpieces, so they're hearing the piano demos. Or there are even some cases where, you know, we're on set and Alex is, like, in the p- part of set that's not being filmed on, like, playing piano live, you know, while Sam Rockwell and Michelle Williams are, like, dancing and singing to that. And then that, 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 that we produce a full, a full track to that. So that, that was really interesting just to... It was new for all of us, you know. I, it was new for Alex, and, uh, you know, um, to be in the film and TV world, and it was new for me to like be that hands-on in like the musical Broadway world. And so I, we really did learn a lot. And I, yeah, I was just the, the the amount of stuff that we just because it's such a crammed timeline of like, you know, just the amount of music that we had to do on a daily basis to just catch up with the production. There, there was there's no way you could do full full, full fleshed out anything. So that's that's pretty cool um, in post thing. Um, uh, um, I mean, maybe not as funny, but uh, there's a, a Netflix film I, I played on called Kodachrome, where um, I, I had to replace um, Jason Sudeikis was playing drums on camera, and so was Ed Harris, and I and they and they and I had to replace their drumming. But Jason Sudeikis is actually a really good drummer, so they kept like half of his drums and like, half of mine, <laughs> and um, and he like and, and I, I got to go to the premiere and we were chatting and he's like he's like he like knows his gear like he's from Kansas and he's like I play this kit and this whole thing it was pretty cool but um, but that was pretty interesting to um, you know get to re- get to replace that in post and um, yeah I'm gonna think of some more as we go on and maybe I'll like blurt out something I I know I have some like ridiculously stupid childish funny story that uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, but this yeah is, this is not like a, a fix it post moment but I it just popped in my head as you were saying that uh, there's this famous Emil Richards sort of uh, mantra and that is like if you're the guy that messes up in the recording session like you're not gonna be like oh I'm sorry I missed half the notes on the chimes can can we do another take so Emil said that if if you make a mistake and you don't want him to use that take, you just make that take unusable. You just knock over a pair of crash cymbals. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually that's not, look, the, the crash cymbals fell. I don't know what that was. Let's do it again. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, funny enough, I wanted to tell the story earlier, but um, but this is like the perfect time to tell it at at Emil's memorial service. This is, I guess, timely. Joe Picaro, who just passed away, you know, really famous drummer. Um, uh, and he he told a story that just had everyone in tears because um, Joe and Emil knew each other from like childhood, um, and Joe had you know said, mentioned to Emil that he wanted to um, you know come out to LA and check out what he was doing you know and Emil's like you know, just just come on like I'll I'll get you on a session or whatever, and um, and you know, he moved out and he got him on some some big session for some TV show or something, and Joe was playing he was in the percussion section. And I forgot, I forgot who the big composer was, but the, and, and Joe, Joe's telling the story. And you know, t- towards the end of the queue, he had like he had just played all this stuff, and he had the rest of it was tacit. Like the rest of the queue was tacit. And um, you know, Emil, uh, you know, was doing something, and he said, "Oh, they, they actually they wrote in a part for you. They they want they at the at this bar that they, they want you to play this Sforzando gong hit. Like this is like this is a Justin from the composer." And he writes in the part, something like a hundred and something bars of rest, and Joe's in the back counting. And it gets to that part, and he just nails the gong, and the conductor just cuts off and says, says "What the? What was that?" And and Emil goes, "Everyone, I'd love to intru- uh, introduce you to a newcomer. This is a uh, J- uh, Joe Picaro." And it's like, <laughs> 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 it's like, 
Oh my god. <laughs> awesome. Let's just do this. It'll be really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Only having Emil Richards as your like to vouch for you and allow him to have a career after that. I, I, I know, know, yeah, yeah. Everyone loved to introduce you. Yeah. <laughs> oh fun. Jeez. Yeah. Well, if you're if you're an avid listener of the podcast, you'll you'll remember that if that happened to Carly and me, Carly wouldn't have had a gong to hit because I forgot to bring it. <laughs> oh, no. Sounds like something Ben might do, though. It does sound like something I would. Do. I wouldn't stand up and vouch for you afterward. <laughs> I know. Woof. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> wow. On a, well, on a more serious note, uh, I wanted <laughs> to I wanted to share a little something related to some current events that have been going on in our country. Um, I came across an NPR article called "How Musicians Helped Integrate the Silver Screen," uh, and in my reading, I found two other things that our listeners might be interested in. Uh, there was an article from Stanford available on the web called "Portrayal of Minorities in Film, Media, and Entertainment Industries." You can find that just googling it. And then there's also a book called "The Hollywood Jim Crow." by Marianne Ariga, that's spelled E-R-I-G-H-A, of the University of Georgia. Um, and I, I did not read the full book, to be clear, but I found a couple of articles that, that were sort of interviews with the author as it was coming out. Uh, and I found some pretty enlightening stuff. Um, so I'd like to start out by mentioning that in 1940, Hattie McDaniel was the first black performer to receive an Oscar uh, for her performance in Gone with the Wind, but she was seated at a different table than her white co-stars because their ceremony was at a segregated venue. Uh, and that obviously we've had many, many race issues in the history of the United States, especially in the 20th century. Um, so I wanted to sort of trace the, the the segregated film industry back to its roots and, and talk about some of the progress that's been made. So in 1914, Sam Lucas was the first black actor to have a lead role in Uncle Tom's Cabin. And the next year, in 1915, uh, D.W. Griffith released a film called The Birth of the, uh, excuse me, The Birth of a Nation, which was a pro-KKK film. It actually had many pioneering film techniques, including close-ups, fade-outs, and a staged battle sequence with extras. It was the first movie to be screened in the White House. It's been, it was viewed by Woodrow Wilson. So it's interesting that this terrible sort of race, prop, race war propaganda movie was also uh, an amazing, you know, filmmaking experiment with those those developments. Um, that film actually led to what were known as race films, which were f films that were produced for black audiences that portrayed black characters with dignity and respect rather than these negative racially charged stereotypes. In 1916, the next year after that, Noble Johnson started the Lincoln Motion, Motion Picture Company, which was the first movie company organized by black filmmakers. They produced a film called The Realization of a Negro's Ambition, which was the first film produced in America that featured black actors in dramatic non-stereotyped roles. And by nine, uh, 1920, this uh, company had produced five films. They made it their mission to not only produce pictures entertaining to Negroes, but to all races. Our market is as large as we make it. The world is our field. Uh, unfortunately, white audiences were not interested in these films. They were largely shown in quote unquote, black venues like black churches, schools, and social organizations, not mainstream theaters, which is perhaps part of the reason that white audiences did not take interest in them. Um, so if you move on to the 1930s, this is a quote from that NPR article. It says, when orchestras started to swing, millions of young, white, middle-class fans suddenly began listening to the same music black audiences had been hearing for years. At this point, black actors in mainstream films were, films were able to escape their sort of stereotypical roles uh, and work in the song and dance genre. And if you're familiar with the history of music and integration, Benny Goodman was largely instrumental in integrating music with his quartet, which featured black musicians Lionel Hampton on vibes and Teddy Wilson on piano. There was a 1937 film called Hollywood Hotel that featured the quartet, but film distributors often cut the scene from Jim Crow markets. <clears throat> um, the drummer in that group was Gene Krupa, who many of us are familiar with from uh, his, you know, the famous rendition of Sing, 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 which I saw that Hal has a credit for an arrangement of Sing, Sing, Sing. Um, but in 1941, there was a film called Ball of Fire, and it featured Gene Krupa's orchestra. Uh, there was a black trumpeter by the name of Roy Eldridge in this uh, orchestra. There was uh, 16 minutes into the film, 
There was this scene where Barbara Stanwyck comes onto the stage and performs drum boogie with the group of band, including Roy Eldridge on the trumpet solo. After the song, Stanwyck leaves and the film reel ends. The next reel begins with an encore featuring only the three white trumpet players. So theaters could actually manipulate the film by simply cutting the main performance and showing the encore. So if you think about it, they had to actually change film reels so they would just stop one reel a couple of minutes early. No one would know the difference because they would still see a musical performance. Um, so, uh, sorry, I lost my place. My notes here. Oh, uh, so theaters could manipulate the film by simply cutting the main performance and showing the encore. And this is another quote from that NPR article. It says, jazz needed an ally, and by 1948, a second front had opened in Major League Baseball. The flag Hampton and Eldridge once carried was now in Jackie Robinson's hands. So obviously, you know that the, the story of Jackie Robinson and how he helped integrate baseball. Um, and then if we move forward quite a bit, uh, in 2014, there was a hack by uh, WikiLeaks that exposed more than 170,000 emails from Sony Pictures Entertainment employees revealing racist casting, including doubts about, I didn't know this till I read up on this, there were doubts about casting Denzel Washington in a major role. There were doubts that the film wouldn't perform well with a black actor in the main role, even if that actor was Denzel Washington. Uh. And next year, in 2015, April Rain tweeted, hashtag Oscars so white as commentary on overwhelming underrepresentation of people in co of people of color despite criticism 2016 was much the same with Idris Elba Samuel L Jackson and Will Smith all overlooked for nominations uh, this is from that uh, Erica book that I mentioned. She points out that Hollywood's film industry flourished during the Jim Crow era and institutional racism was therefore part of it. Recent commentary suggests that blockbuster hits like Black Panther and Crazy Rich Asians, both from 2018 with minority rich casting marks a turn for the better with much progress still to be made. So that's the sort of uh, state of black representation and, and just representation of people in, of color in general in the Hollywood film industry. Um, and I, I thought it was really neat that, that Gene Krupa and Benny Goodman were two of the pioneers of this. Yeah, what well, was kind of the point of, of the article, which I, I loved, by the way, good call. And thanks for sharing it. What well, was it kind of saying, hey, early jazz music, and I guess it's not that early, but was really instrumental, no pun intended, but in getting uh, in getting the arts desegregated and eventually getting film desegregated. Yeah, and I, I think also, I mean, just a, a major takeaway point from this, not to pat ourselves on the back, but there's been a pretty good history of, of musicians and the arts uh, not discriminating. Um, we want the best musician, not the best white musician or anything like that. And there's that famous story of uh, Marilyn Monroe, I think, when uh, Ella Fitzgerald was, a club refused to book Ella Fitzgerald. Marilyn Monroe said that, you know, if you book her, I'll be in the front row every single night to, you know, create yeah. the crowd. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, yeah jazz musicians, obviously jazz is a, a largely originates from a quote unquote black art form. Um, and I think that that's a, it's a genre that hasn't forgotten that and has, has long touted the flag of equality. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. That's really, that's really cool. And it just, of course, makes so much sense. I mean, it's like, yeah, when we have this love of music and we, sh we share this appreciation for talent and ability and yeah, I mean, obviously it can, it can be very powerful. Yeah, and one one other thing, just to to kind of reiterate this, I mean, like when I came across that quote about Denzel Washington, it's like, come on, this is like one of the best actors of all time. Like, there's concerns oh, yeah. about, it. and and they're like yeah. basically the the Hollywood industry says like, well, it's it's not that we can't have black actors, it's just that we're we're afraid that films with black lead roles will flop, and it's and like the the kind of comeback to that is like white lead films flop all the time it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's um <laughs> the, the real famous guy named daryl davis who's famous for his ted talk and, and several talks and interviews but he i guess got 100 i think over 100 kkk members to leave the ku klux klan his name is daryl davis and it all started with a clan member hearing him play piano because he's a keyboardist and uh, he's a he's a boogie woogie pianist and they heard him playing in a bar. I was like, wow, you, you're you're like fantastic. So it was the interest of music that got this clan member to start a conversation with him, which led Daryl Davis into, into investigating this and actually begin going to clan rallies, getting to know members of the clan and 
converting them. And I, I think he's, he's, yeah, so he's, he's very, very famous, Daryl Davis, TED Talk. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty inspiring. Ksenia, I think you had some. Um, I was going to say a great article, and thanks so much, Ben. Uh, but I was also going to add that um, I think it's what we feel today about Denzel Washington being, or Denzel, sorry, I pronounce things in Serbian way, sorry, but being, um, you know, people being suspicious of whether he's going to be a good leader of a, of a movie. I mean, that's that's ridiculous, but the same ridiculousness applies to a, a white woman needing to be in the front row in order for Ella Fitzgerald to be allowed to perform somewhere. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. And that stuff, the ridiculousness, you know, goes way, way back. But I wanted to ask Hal about his impressions um, on the diversity right now. From what you see in Hollywood, what's up now, at least in the music world? Oh, well, you're muted, Hal. I thought you were all techie. What is this? <laughs> For most of my job is white. <laughs> that's, that's my fault. <laughs> that's my fault. Um, no, you know, um, yeah, also, thanks, Ben, for that. That, that was really, um, I, I was listening to that, actually, Brian sent me that uh, that NPR thing I was listening to on the way, way home, and um, I, I had no idea about about uh, about Gene Krupa and Benny Goodman and, and the whole thing, but, um, but you know, I... You know, it, it it's still it's still an issue. I think you know, um, you know the you know inclusion with everyone and making sure things are actually the playing field is actually even. But I do think uh, we are in a really um, revolutionary time because I uh, you know I I am seeing um, such a diverse amount of people on various um, sessions and things that I um, you know that I show up to. I I know. Um, the recording of the Lion King score is actually a really big deal because um, because just, just of like the diversity that was brought in and um, you know and you know striving to make that like the norm, which is you know I think is really important. Um, but you know it, it's something that I that I I, I am very very aware of. Um, but you know I. I you know, it's 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 kind of an ongoing on on ongoing topic that I I think is is starting to you know be taken really seriously. Um, but you know, it, it, it's funny. It's one of those things that I guess you know, being a being a, a white male, you know, coming from a fairly you know privileged part of the country. Uh, well, Florida isn't. It's not a privilege to be from Florida, but a, a fairly privileged part of Florida. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, Florida it's, sucks. It's, what are you? <laughs> you know, Florida. You know, it, it's not really you know on your radar. You know, it, it's not really something that I I really really th thought about like oh th this ensemble is a hundred percent white you know it's, it's not really something that i really um you know until i until you become aware of it and you're and you think oh 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 that's how it sounds that's exactly how it sounds when you become woke people <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I guess I, you know, but it's also, you know, the, the behavior is something that, which I think the Daryl Davis thing speaks, speaks, um, speaks volumes of. It's, it's something that, you know, isn't, isn't. Uh, I think it's instinctual, something that you're taught growing up. You know, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's so, it's, it's something that I think everyone needs to be, needs to be aware of. Um, and it's also, I, I read a really interesting article. A couple interesting articles about uh, about the orchestra world and about the the l seeming seeming lack of diversity in 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 the orchestra world. But then but then you think you know, and, and I had a really good d discussion about this with a couple peers a few weeks ago actually. Um, with well, these are blind auditions, and then you think, well, this actually transcends the blind audition. I think it's the fact that you know to get a marimba at your house, you know, costs upwards of four grand, you know, to practice or like the, get the proper tools, um, you know, a proper education. I think, I think it, it's not, I think it doesn't just come from the people who are hiring. I think it comes from. Yeah. It's, it's in, like, that's the whole, like people don't understand institutional racism is, is very different from just like overtly saying like, I don't like black people. That's, that's not that's, institutional. It's like, it's built in from before you're in kindergarten <laughs> that you're in worse schools. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Worse schools, like worse, worse instruments. I mean, like, it, it's it's really, you know, I, I think it really is. It's crazy, and I think it does go. I think it's something that should be addressed by us, especially 
uh, you know, instrument companies, you know, the fact that it, for any instrument, like not just percussion, it costs thousands and thousands of dollars to have a, to have a, to have like a, like a professional quality instrument, you know, or like in, you know, like in the composition technology world, you know, you got to buy Pro Tools, you got to buy speakers, you know, I mean, like, you know, you spend thousands and thousands of dollars just to get a sound going, you know, it's, 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 it's wild. And I think that's, you know, that's not right. It's also, you know, I think this, that logic can also be, you know, trans, transmitted to like, why is McDonald's one dollar and like a, a, like an actual salad or like farm to table burger is $18, you know, it's, you know. Yeah. Yep. Capitalism. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think you you really nailed it. How that we're we're in a very revolutionary time right now. It's it's a crazy time for so many. I think that that's a good thing, absolutely. But it's also obviously very uh, difficult right now because of the coronavirus and everything that's going on there. How has has COVID nineteen had an effect? on everything out on the West Coast. I mean, California is obviously in very dire straits right now, as is Texas, Louisiana, where I'm at is not great. Florida is obviously really bad as well. How is that affecting the industry that you're in right now? Uh, you know, I, I think it's affecting everyone, I'd say sort of equally in a sense, you know, where I think this is the best time that is able to showcase Hollywood's pipeline, right? Because basically, when 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 the COVID lockdown started, um, at least for me, I had some things on the calendar that weren't supposed to happen for a while. That were mainly for like streaming services like Disney Plus or Netflix or you know stuff like that. That all of a sudden got pushed up to like we need to get this done like now, and we need to get this done as fast as possible because people are home watching content. Um, and so there were, I just, there were a few weeks when COVID started where, you know, I just had like an influx of just like, just a mass amount of work because of like the streaming service thing. Um, and you know, TV was still, a lot of stuff is in post-production. Um, you know, the, and so that there, that there's been a chance to work still, but that being said, we're in what month five now of, of, of lockdown, you know, uh, scoring sessions have just started in-person sessions have just started as of like about a week ago. Um, you know, so things are starting to get up and running slowly to kind of see how it goes. But, um, you know, a lot of people have found themselves having to learn how to record themselves from home. I think not only in, you know, in the this world, but I think probably in the education world as well. I mean, you'd say you get a, you know, and so um, I, I've, I've had a, a recording setup going for quite a few years now. Um, I feel lucky to have invested the money really early on, but, um, so it's, you know, it's been a good thing. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's something where it's like, then, you know, you get a gig and you're not only just having to take the job of the player, but also as an engineer and like, you know, you're obviously ha being paid for one job and you're taking three other people's jobs. Um, but on the positive side, um, I, <laughs> this is going to sound really weird, but I've gotten, um, some gigs that I know that I would not have been hired for had it not been for COVID. I mean, I'll flat out say uh, I've been lucky to have played on uh, Terrence Blanchard's score for Perry Mason. I know for a fact I was not Terrence Blanchard's first choice. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, and also I, I also we uh, I just did a whole week um, did SpongeBob, the new SpongeBob movie here. And once again, I I was not Hans Zimmer's first choice for, for uh, you know, for, for, for that. But, you know, I'm lucky to, to, to have had the work and the opportunity to, you know, that's, I think the big takeaway from this sort of job is, is, you know, you, you spend all this time working, 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 and, and practicing, 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 practicing for the time to shine. And that time can come, you know, at 11 PM on a Saturday night and your computer's not working and like your laundry washer is exp exploded and like, you know, you're the whole thing I mean, you have to deliver, you know, by 7 AM the next morning and, but you can do it. And so I think, I think, you know, that's important is, is being ready to go whenever you are called upon, um, you know, when, whatever career that, that may be. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, there are also you know, things that I had going on before COVID started that have steadily continued. Um, and also I just, I used Netflix for the first time. Like I, I really had never had a Netflix or Hulu account before this whole thing started. So I've been like having a real life. It's been feeling really nice. <laughs> um, paying attention to, you know, like sleep and, 
and stuff. Um, so it, it, it's, it's been good, but it's, it's impacted a lot of people, especially those who were, were touring based musicians have entire two years worth of work just completely wiped out. Um, you know, it, ha- it happens. It, it, it happens. I, I, had a, I, had a, I was supposed to play Hamilton here as the substitute drummer, you know, and, and that and that completely wiped out one fell swoop. Um, but uh, it happens. You know, I, I think we're always dealing with it in our own ways. I think it's like the mindset and outlook that you have on it. Um, you know, I think you make that yourself. I think, you know, spending yeah, a positive I, life. I was just, just going to add a quick little anecdote. I, there's that that uh, what's that saying that uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah, and yeah. You're talking about like you know, you're like I'm not Hans Zimmer's first choice. And a great example of this is uh, the the drummer Steve Jordan. Uh, you can look up the the story on your own, oh, but yeah. basically Steve Jordan was in New York and he was not a famous drummer at the time. And there was a huge blizzard, and he was the only guy that could like put on snow boots and make it to the recording studio. And yeah, that's yeah. how Steve Jordan's career started. So yeah, it's pretty yeah. pretty cool that you got those you know gigs. You said you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Yeah. I, I, the majority of my career has been just from like someone got sick and like like I it, the it's it's wild like just peripherally being around when these things happen. Um, I think that you know I, I know a drummer actually he's like one of the big Broadway guys. When he first moved to town, he would seven thirty he'd get himself in you know in Times Square and all Broadway black with drumsticks and inevitably some Broadway drummer would say ah my train's running late can you go cover the first act for me and that's how he you started getting gigs was he was just ready to go at 7:30, and you know he would just start he was, at one point he said he was subbing 10 shows at once because wow. because you know someone's inevitably a few minutes late wild wow I, so I'm, I'm curious how it like with the fact that you've got your your you know you've got kind of a studio set up behind you there and everything like we all think of like you know the giant sound stage and whatever, but how common is that now? To like like is someone is like a is someone sending you like stems from a Pro Tool session? Like hey, we need you to just uh, we need a you know a marimba lick. We need you to play this marimba lick and record this into this or this suspended cymbal roll or like is that a pretty common thing now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'll often get yeah like stems or like a mix minus whatever I'm recording and. If I'm lucky, music to to go off of, um, <laughs> um, or uh, yeah, and then I'll just I'll just lay it down and send it back. I mean, um, I've been I've got I've been I feel very lucky to have been getting into the pop music world lately. Um, I, I played on one of the later latest Jonas Brothers songs, and, and you know all, all that's done in Sweden. I, I'm the only person who's in the U.S. doing that, and and for that they they sent me 12 bars of like the beat for the song. And I was like, well, I'll give him 16 to make it even. Um, and then ne- next thing you know, it's like dispersed all over the track and and, and there you go. And so it's, it, you know, but like with something like SpongeBob or something, I got parts and, you know, I'm actually doing it like marimba and like stuff. And so, uh, but yeah, it's just like, here's the, here's the tracks, send me back finished tracks and I can plop them in and they are ready to go and they sound good. And are you doing like are you doing production to them as well? Like okay, I'm 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 playing a tambour, I'm playing a marimba part, but then I'm also going to be EQing and all that. Or are you just sending them raw materials and like let them deal with all that stuff? Um, sometimes you know, so, so, sometimes I try to do that as little as possible. I have like a setup here where I can get a little just show a little quick thing here. Um, like I, I've got this. Uh, it's not turned on at the moment. Well, I guess it can be. Um, but I've got this rack here that is just like my my standard sound that I just know it's going to sound pretty good no matter what I record into it. Um, and I try to do as little work as possible on that front, um, you know, or like, you know, here's my actual like computer rack um, that, you know, just, you know, I, 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 IT person. But, um, but you know, there, there are some times that we'll, 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 I'll, get, I'll get a thing saying, hey, can you lay down some like some effects percussion? And uh, yeah, I'll go into my microphone and go like, <sighs> you know, just like make weird sounds out of that, but more or less, I just use your ear, make sure it sounds good. You're not getting any weird, like, ground hum, or like, you know, you're getting a crisp sound, like as if I, you'd be in a, a hall. And then, then the engineer usually is responsible for tweaking and tweaking. But there's a little bit of EQ that just goes into like, you know, you shouldn't have anything below definitely 20 or 30 hertz on your marimba tracks, um, you know, and stuff like that, just to kind of sometimes help a little bit. But you don't have to. It's just something that doesn't hurt to get a little into, you know. Aww. Adorable baby. <laughs> Robin has joined Robin. us. Robin. Robin's here again. Robin came to say bye. Hey, Robin, can you say bye-bye? 
Can you tell everyone bye bye? Can you say bye bye? <laughs> As the poor child is held against his will. I just want to go, dude. <laughs> Get down. Get down. Yep, all done. Bye, hey. everyone. Bye, everyone. Yeah, Aww. yeah. Bye. Come and say, say bye one more time. Bye. Thank you. Wow. Oh. See, he's training to take over. He's going to be bummed out when he finds out no pay comes with it. Yeah, 14 <laughs> more years from now when he's, you know, <laughs> eligible to work, he's going to be really bummed to find out, wow, we still don't make any money doing this. Yeah, <laughs> All those hours, Dad. I know. Like, how, do you, how do you spend that many years doing this podcast? You're still getting money. That's really bizarre. I really respect it, though. It's really. I, I've listened to many episodes myself, and it, it's really cool. I, I think it's a really great way to just not only like dive into the percussion world, but also, um, yeah, it's, it's a real. It's like the some of the most down to earth, like just chatting. It's it's really, it's really important. It's not like a very businessy sort of thing. So I, I really love 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 what everyone's doing and the time to do it. So the last thing we are on this podcast is businessy. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well thanks Hal. That means a lot. That's awesome to hear it. And man, it's so great to to have you here. I feel like we could easily keep talking a long time. Yeah. I didn't even ask you how you got all those mallets on your body in this picture that I'm going to overlay right now. Right. I think that, it's that picture that picture really, really pissed off innovative percussion, unfortunately. They were like, none of these are, are, are mallets. Oh. <laughs> I, was, I was like, the fact that your artist price is still like 50 bucks a pair of mallets, this would have caught it an expensive picture. <laughs> it's like it's like you you ran through an Indiana Jones uh, set of traps and you got all the poison darts, but there was all mallets. <laughs> I love it. Hey, everyone, thank you so much for listening again, and we'll catch you on 245. Hal, thanks so much. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Carly. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ksenia. And yeah, lovely to hear from you, Hal. Yeah, thanks, everyone, really. And also, I guess to, to just uh, sign this off real quick, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention we are doing uh, Whiplash live in concert to the movie, uh, premiering in South Korea October 3rd. Uh, I've been uh, tasked with a adapting all the and transcribing all the drums for that. So maybe everyone can stop asking me if I've seen Whiplash after that. Oh, <laughs> so, my God. Good luck. <laughs> that's, that's the one famous person I've met is the the, the, the director, that actor. Oh, J.K. Simmons? Yeah. He's yeah, like, Simmons. He's got, you know, his dad was like the director of bands at University of Montana, I think. That's where I and, met him. Yeah. Um, that's, why, that's why he was there. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He gets. Super cool. So yeah, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that on a percussion podcast that that is happening. <laughs> cool, cool. Whiplash, the most authentic, authentic <laughs> moment yeah. of all time. You know, you know, it doesn't piss me off that much. Like everyone's like, oh, nah, nah, nah. like yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Come on, it's 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 fun. a movie. I know. It's actually it's, it's actually based on Robert Van Sice, from what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Just kidding. Just no. kidding. Ben, you've <laughs> dug your brain. You're out of here, Ben. You're out of here. Yeah. This is not getting edited out, Ben. <laughs> we'll do, we will. All right. Hey, thanks. You better everybody. bribe the editor. Bye. 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 Bye.